International News Now. <laughs> okay, for today's session, we're going to cover the following issues. First, we're going to provide an overview of the most recent developments in the Ukraine-Russia-U.S. crisis. We're going to provide a summary of the major moves taken by all sides in the crisis. We're going to briefly discuss how the U.S. and its allies have attempted to remain united and provide a common set of deterrent threats to try and convince Russia not to invade Ukraine because the costs in the form of Western sanctions will be too high. At the same time, the Western alliance has also pursued diplomatic attempts to come to some negotiated settlement that could resolve the crisis through a compromise on the status of Ukraine. For Russia's part, we will briefly discuss the major development revolving around President Putin's meeting with, Chinese, with China's leader Xi Jinping to announce a further strengthening of cooperation between China and Russia to confront the United States and the West. I think their joint statement mentioned the United States critically six times, I believe I read that. Second, we're going to develop, delve deeper into the dynamics within the Western alliance. We're going to talk about the status of Germany which has been seen by some as being too weak in its response to possible Russian aggression against Ukraine. And we're going to discuss some of the other divisions within NATO on how best to respond to Russia in this crisis. Third, we're going to discuss one possible off-ramp that could help to de-escalate the crisis, known as the Minsk Agreements, or also referred to as the Normandy Format Talks. This is a promise, a process to find a compromise for the deeper conflict between Russia and Ukraine over Ukraine's status and the ongoing separatist conflict in the eastern part of Ukraine. An agreement known as Minsk II was negotiated in 2014 by a group of four countries, Russia, Ukraine, France, and Germany. It had several provisions that were never enacted. However, now many observers, including national leaders, both Putin and the Ukrainian President Zelensky, see it as the best hope for a resolution. Fourth, we're going to take a look at the debate within the United States over the American reaction to Russia's actions against Ukraine, and we're going to focus on a growing split within the Republican Party between really a more muscular version of foreign policy and a neo-isolationist version of U.S. foreign policy over whether the United States should side with Ukraine in the present crisis. Right. All right, so we want to start today with a discussion of the devel developments surrounding the crisis over the past three weeks, especially the diplomatic efforts by leaders of European countries to avoid war. And so we're going to start with a news clip from the PBS NewsHour that highlights the continued diplomatic um, efforts by leaders of France and Germany uh, to try to find a compromise solution that would avoid war. So let's run that clip now. It was a day for diplomacy on the Ukraine crisis, from Washington to Moscow and beyond. All this is more than 100,000 Russian troops mass along the border with Ukraine. Foreign Affairs correspondent Nick Schifrin has followed the events of this busy day. I'm delighted to have the chancellor here today. Across nearly 5,000 miles from the White House to the Kremlin, a day of diplomacy. French President Emmanuel Macron met with Russian President Vladimir Putin and expressed hope that war could be averted. Putin called the talks useful. Some of his ideas and proposals, about which I think are too early to speak, but I think these ideas could form a basis for our further joint steps. And new German Chancellor Olaf Scholz met with President Biden. They tried to present a united front. He has the complete trust of the United States, Germany, is our, one of our most important allies in the world. There is no doubt about Germany's partnership with the United States, none. It is important that we act together, that we stand together, and that we do what is necessary together. But the unity rhetoric doesn't match the whole reality. Germany prevents fellow NATO members from sending German ammunition to Ukraine. And Germany refuses to publicly threaten the German-Russian pipeline Nord Stream 2 if Russia invades Ukraine. Germany has indefinitely paused the certification process. The White House wants to use that pause as leverage over Russia. Today, Biden was clear and Scholz switched to English to try and back him up. The notion that Nord Stream, T would go, Nord Stream 2 would go forward with an invasion by the Russians is just not going to happen. 
We will be united. We will act together and we will take all the necessary steps and all the necessary steps will be done by all of us together. The U.S. and much of NATO are trying to take military steps to reinforce the alliance. Today, American soldiers, usually based in the U.S., landed in Poland to bolster a thousand NATO troops already deployed there. European countries are also reinforcing NATO's eastern flank with European jets and European soldiers, all in an attempt to deter any war in Ukraine from expanding into NATO. But the Russians continue to expand their military footprint on NATO and Ukraine's borders. The Ministry of Defense releases video nearly every day of troops practicing the tactics they could use if they invaded Ukraine. U.S. officials tell PBS NewsHour Russia now has nearly three-quarters of what they would need for a full invasion. And U.S. officials say if Russian soldiers did invade, they could inflict catastrophic casualties, including 50,000 civilians, and cause millions to flee. The U.S. also fears that Russian soldiers could capture Kyiv and overthrow the government in a matter of days. He's in a position now to be able to invade, almost uh, assuming that uh, um, the, uh, the ground is frozen above Kyiv. Uh, he has the capacity to do that. And Biden also that. urged Americans to leave Kyiv. I think it'd be wise to leave the country. Uh, not, I don't mean our, I don't mean, I'm not talking about our diplomatic corps. I'm talking about Americans who are there. I hate to see them get caught in a crossfire. But nothing is containing Russia's military buildup even as diplomacy continues, President Macron heads to Kyiv tomorrow. Okay, so uh, let me make a few points here. First, relatively early on in the crisis, the Biden administration announced that it would deploy 3,000 additional troops to Poland and Romania, which are East European countries within NATO, so they're NATO members that are on, kind of on the front line of this crisis because they border Ukraine. And so... Uh, the United States arguably took this step for at least three reasons. First, the Biden administration wanted to signal to NATO members in Eastern Europe that the United States remains committed to its obligation in the tr NATO treaty to defend NATO members against attack with military force if necessary. So committing additional U.S. soldiers to the region enhances this commitment by placing more American troops in harm's way uh, in case there would be any sort of aggression. So that's the first reason, is to sort of bolster the American sort of signal and commitment to those East European uh, NATO allies. And second, uh, the Biden administration wanted to send this same signal to Russia to demonstrate that the U.S. is prepared to push back strongly, right, even with military force, if necessary, against any attempt by Russia to use similar tactics to threaten East European countries that are member NATO, I mean, uh, that are members of NATO, right? And so you have to remember, you know, he, Putin drew this red line on Ukraine because Ukraine's not a NATO member, but there are already former Soviet republics, former countries, now independent countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that are members of NATO. And so, if you sort of extend this logic that the, so, you know, Russia deserves a, a sphere of influence, especially in uh, countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, uh, Ukraine is an easier one to sort of execute that um, sort of policy because it's not a member of NATO, but there are former Soviet republics that are members of NATO, and uh, the Biden administration seems to want to make sure that Russia doesn't think that it could do similar things in those three Baltic republics. And there are significant Russian minority populations in those republics as well. So this whole idea of protecting Russian speakers could be used against those states too. But they, uh, what the West wants to do is, is try to draw its own lines um, in a way uh, on that aspect. And finally, the Biden administration likely took this action for domestic reasons as well. Members of Congress and other political actors from both parties are watching the Biden administration carefully during this crisis for signs on how he will handle this latest foreign policy issue. Now, there, um, there are competing narratives from both Democrats and Republicans about how tough the United States needs to be in its efforts to deter Russia from invading Ukraine. And Biden's 
actions here can be interpreted as a show of strength against possible Russian uh, aggression for the domestic audience within the United States um, as well as for the international audience. So, now, uh, the clip also highlighted the diplomatic efforts of French President Emmanuel Macron in Russia, Ukraine, and then he, he also went on to Germany to, to speak with some NATO allies there. And the French president has engaged, uh, kind of emerged as, at least in my view, a somewhat surprising leading figure in European efforts to find a compromise with Russia that will avoid war. And there's uh, a few reasons Macron has taken on this role. First. He is running for re-election in April, and so projecting an image as a major international figure, uh, leading the effort to avoid uh, the biggest war in Europe since World War II could help him win that upcoming election. And so there's a po domestic political aspect to Macron's moves here. But also, Macron um, has argued strongly for a min more independent role for the European Union in international relations and specifically called for the EU to hold talks with Russia on the Ukraine crisis. And so this shuttle diplomacy by the French president may be part of a broader plan to expand France's role as a leader of a more emboldened European Union that acts um, a bit more independently from the United States to try to manage uh, crises and, and international issues on the European continent. And then finally, uh, France may be a useful intermediary between Russia and the United States on this conflict. And, and we'll see in the next section, France has taken a somewhat less confrontational approach toward Russia and thus may get a little more uh, receptive response from President Putin uh, than either a meeting with between Biden and Putin or one of the more hawkish European leaders like Prime Minister Boris Johnson of Great Britain. And so, so for those three reasons, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, functional uh, benefit for Macron himself, for his vision of what a, European a new European security arrangement might look like and what France's role would be in it. And then it's also um, perhaps beneficial for the United States to have him do this as well. And so, so now at the same time that the French president was shuttling from Moscow to Kiev um, to talk with Putin and then Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky, the new German Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with uh, President Biden. And the purpose of this visit uh, by the German leader to Washington was quite different from the mission that President uh, Macron charted out for himself. Um, and we're going to discuss this more in depth shortly, but Germany has been widely criticized for its initial reaction to, Ger uh, to Russia's moves against Ukraine. And several commentators and even some political leaders in the U.S. and Europe have stated that Germany may be a weak link, if you will, in the United Front that the United States and Europe wants to have in trying to um, deter Russia during this crisis. So the primary reason that the German leader went to Washington to meet with uh, Biden was to show that Germany was firmly on board with the United States and the rest of NATO in confronting Russia. That was the, the theme, so to speak. And so the joint news conference with the two leaders tried to accomplish that. Biden, as you saw in the clip, said that Schultz and Germany had the complete trust of the United States. And Schultz said, quote, right, uh, we will be united, we will act together, and all the necessary steps will be done by all of us together. So together, we're part of the same team, and uh, Germany wants to, to provide that. So, so the two leaders said all the right things, but both German and American reporters um, at this news conference uh, noted that the uh, German chancellor still did not explicitly endorse the American position that a Russian invasion would mean the end of a controversial natural gas pipeline called Nord Stream 2, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second, that has been built 
to deliver natural gas directly from Russia to Ger Germany, uh, but is not yet operational. So it's, it's all built, but it, it is not transiting gas yet. Um, and so there is still a bit of a disconnect, if you uh, will, between um, what is the German and American leaders are trying to project as, as a seamless united front and some of their statements um, and perceived intentions are. It's, it's still a bit unclear. And so um, the last thing to note here is that we uh, should acknowledge that Russian President Vladimir Putin has not just been sitting around watching all these guys go around trying to avoid uh, a Russian invasion of Ukraine. He has done his own uh, mobilization, if you will. And so he uh, traveled to China. Putin traveled to China for the Winter Olympics and was the most high-profile world leader to attend the opening ceremonies of the Winter Games. Um, a number of countries led by the United States uh, participated in a diplomatic boycott that didn't really work out very well. There wasn't a lot of takers. Um, uh, and this boycott was to uh, sort of oppose China's uh, and bring to light China's poor record on protecting human rights. And so the United States, Australia, some other, other countries did not send any officials. They, they allowed the athletes to participate, but they didn't have any official delegation to attend. Now, Putin wanted to give the exact opposite um, signal and so personally went to China for the games. And so while Putin was in China. He met individually with the Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, and the two leaders announced in a, in a joint news conference a, a new and expanded partnership of cooperation with no limits was the big punchline. And so um, China, during this sort of, there was a memorandum that was kind of published that President, I mean, Professor McDonald clearly went through and counted all the times they said something bad about the United States. Um, six, right? <laughs> yes, six. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> and so... This was in the New York Times I, summary of it. Come on now. Of course. <laughs> so anyway, they published this memorandum, and China publicly supported Russia's demand that Ukraine not be allowed to uh, enter NATO. So they said, yeah, Russia's right. No way. And then um, Russia publicly opposed any form of independence for Taiwan, which is a key issue for China in its own struggle with the United States over influence on Russia and its own sort of um, claims that Taiwan is a part of China and needs to be reincorporated into the Chinese state. And so, so they're giving each other the sort of political support that... Um, would help. I mean, China is a, a major player in international relations, and, and so the United States quickly uh, criticized China for for taking that stand. Um, but most importantly, uh, economic support from a huge economy like China could be crucial for Russia if it does decide to invade Ukraine um, and face, and then as a consequence, it faces these strong economic sanctions. Uh, from the United States and Europe. China could potentially provide a lifeline of sorts to get around those sanctions or survive the sanctions until um, uh, for at least a certain period of time. So, so we're going to talk probably more about this because it has more far-reaching ramifications um, uh, in future uh, episodes. So, and. and as a means of transition here, we should just emphasize that this is getting talked about this week in the aftermath of this meeting, a new alliance of autocracies. And right. this could be the deeper legacy of the Ukraine crisis. If there's no war, if some deal associated with the Minsk agreements gets, gets agreed to, the legacy of this could be a remaking of great power coalitions that, right. that clearly pushes Russia and China together against the United States and really would then remake the structure of global politics that Nixon set up in the early 1970s when he went to, to China and broke China away from, from Russia. So, um, so watch this. Um, as Ra mentioned, it's really important with respect to economic sanctions, and, and this is part of the conversation. Are these autocratic states pulling in other middle countries and to try and create a pool of economic resources that allow them to get past 
uh, Western economic there sanctions. There was a meeting also with Iranian leaders yeah. too, it seemed, uh, in, in this period. And so you could find, you know, a, a, a coalition, if you will, of some of these states that um, would be an effective adversary. And there's, there's also some theory here, right? There's some balancing mm -hmm. uh, going on here that um, sort of brings about a more multipolar world um, uh, is a legacy of this. So. so let's move on now to take a closer look at relations within NATO as it tries to project a united front against Russia's potential invasion of Ukraine. We're going to start by examining Germany's role in the crisis thus far by watching a clip from CNN on the German position toward Ukraine. So let's go ahead and run that clip. As Russia continues amassing troops at Ukraine's borders, the U.S. and its allies have stepped up deliveries of defensive weapons to Kiev, including armor-piercing anti-tank missiles. Notably missing, though, NATO partner Germany. The Germans only offering 5,000 helmets for the Ukrainians facing Russian tanks. The German government has said very clearly that we will not send any lethal weapons or arms deliveries to conflict areas because we do not want to fuel these conflicts further. But Germany is coming off a record year for arms exports. The top client, Egypt, despite its difficult human rights track record. Ukraine's ambassador to Berlin says his country is not happy. I think that they have to reconsider and they have really uh, start helping us with, with the weapons of a defensive type which we need right now. Some NATO countries are questioning just how reliable an ally Berlin is when it comes to confronting Russian aggression. Especially after the head of the German Navy recently had to resign after saying Vladimir Putin deserves respect. When dealing with Russia, Germany is still haunted by its past, says Zuda David Wilk from the German Marshall Fund in Berlin. They're afraid of ha sending weapons to Ukraine and those weapons being used against Russians, given uh, the number of Russians that were killed during World War II. But let's be honest, there were huge amounts of Ukrainians that were victims as well during World War II. Millions of Ukrainians were killed as Hitler's army overran what was then the Ukrainian part of the Soviet Union. Nearly the entire Jewish population there wiped out. But Germany also has hard economic reasons for going soft on Russia. Its dependence on Russian gas and the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, the $11 billion undersea link between the two countries. While Berlin recently claimed the pipeline was a purely economic project, at least now the government says a Russian invasion of Ukraine would have an impact. If there is renewed aggression, we have the full bandwidth of measures, including Nord Stream 2. The U.S. has long urged Berlin to use Nord Stream 2, which is not yet certified for gas transit, as leverage to deter Moscow. Now, the State Department says if Russia invades, the project is dead. If Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. But Aaron, the Germans are still very much moving forward with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. In fact, a German subsidiary has just been founded to try and speed up the certification process here in Europe. All this as the Germans continue to say that they are very much in the U.S.'s corner and would support tough sanctions against Moscow if there's a further invasion of Ukraine. All right, let me start first by saying that Germany's position on the Ukraine crisis is vitally important. Germany is the largest and most powerful country in Western Europe. It's been the leader on economic and political issues within the European Union for a long time. Germany enjoyed stable and influential leadership from Chancellor Angela Merkel for nearly two decades. She took a leading role in virtually every major international decision involving Europe, including relations with Russia and the issues associated with the status of Ukraine. Merkel stepped down just last year and the new chancellor has been on the job for only a couple of months. So many observers were watching Germany closely during this first crisis of the post-Merkel era. Did you? <laughs> Welcome to the big board table. <laughs> so, Welcome to the adult table. <laughs> so the, the new chancellor did not get off to a strong start. First, Germany made news by refusing to provide Ukraine with weapons to help it defend itself against Russia in case of an invasion. Many other European countries, as well as the United States, provided weapons. Not only that, but Germany seemed to block the transport of weapons from other countries to Ukraine. 
This caused many European leaders to criticize Germany and begin to question its loyalty to the Western alliance. As the clip shows, Germany has some historical reasons for resisting the push to supply Ukraine or any country in a conflict with weapons due to the legacy of World War II. Germany has avoided intervening militarily or providing weapons to a conflict zone because of its central role in World War II under the Nazi regime. This is particularly sensitive when the conflict involves Russia because Nazi Germany killed millions of Soviet citizens during its invasion of the Soviet Union in World War II. And as the clip notes, however, Nazi Germany killed many Ukrainians as well during its occupation of Soviet Ukraine during World War II. So in addition to its controversial decision to not send weapons to Ukraine, Germany also faces criticism over the natural gas pipeline called Nord Stream 2. When fully operational, Nord Stream 2 will be able to transport Russian natural gas under the Baltic Sea directly to Germany, bypassing Ukraine and other Eastern European countries. This pipeline has been controversial even prior to the current crisis over Ukraine because it will increase, it will increase the EU's reliance on Russian natural gas and cut out Ukraine in the transport of natural gas from Russia to Europe. Now, now, cutting out Ukraine has two big, you know, aspects to it, right? One is money, right? Ukraine makes a significant, a significant enough amount of money from just transit fees that, that that'll be a hit against a pretty fragile economy. But secondly, you know, if a pipeline goes across Ukrainian territory, then Ukraine is instrumental in the transit of Russian natural gas to Europe and then has some leverage over Ukraine, I mean, over Russia, and then could use that leverage to, to kind of um, push back against a potential invasion, for example. And so you take Russia, Ukraine out of the whole equation, and then um, it's easier to do what Putin's doing now. Yeah. Um. So the construction of Nord Stream 2 is complete, but it's not operational because it has not gone through cert certification, which can be a long process. The pipeline is vitally important to both Russia and Germany, as well as other EU countries for economic reasons. Consequently, Germany has worked hard to keep Nord Stream 2 out of global politics. It also plays a role in American politics. A lot of amb ambassadors have not been approved by the Senate because our senator from Texas, Ted Cruz, has blocked these Senate's consideration of these appointments because he wants to pressure the administration into sanctioning Russia for the pipeline, and he argues that this is the way that you prevent a Russian invasion of Ukraine. So, of course, energy politics is at the heart of this, plays political as well as an economic role in the relationship between Russia and Germany. Russia supplies Germany with more than half of its natural gas, and that provides Russia with a lot of political leverage over Germany. Thus, Nord Stream 2 is a symbol of this broader leverage that Russia enjoys as the main supplier of energy to Europe. So the Biden administration wants to use Nord Stream 2 as leverage in trying to deter Russia from invading Ukraine, but it needs Germany to go along with this. Germany is clearly less eager to see the pipeline becoming a bargaining chip or part of the package of sanctions that the Western alliance might place on Russia in retaliation for invading Ukraine. There seemed to be some level of agreement that blocking Nord Stream 2 would at least be on the table if Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, the German Chancellor would not say this explicitly, but Biden declared that the U.S. would, quote, end it. How the U.S. would accomplish this without Germany's help was not explained and is a significant um, question to be answered. Biden just said that the U.S. could do it. He said, trust me, we can do it. Yeah. And then he said, he was like, how would you do that? And he was like, we, we just can't. <laughs> and so it's, that's the definition of a questionably credible threat. Yeah. <laughs> So let's now take a look at how some other European countries and their leaders have reacted to the Ukraine crisis. So we're going to watch another clip here, this one from the PBS NewsHour. Moscow trying to rebuild the Soviet empire. In Ukraine's parliament today, a show of thanks for NATO countries that have supported Ukraine's military. In the last few weeks, the United Kingdom has increased its support, including with weapons designed to destroy Russian tanks. 
Today, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson became the first Western head of government to visit Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky during the current crisis. Both warned war could challenge Europe's future. This is not going to be a war of Ukraine and Russia. This is going to be a European war, a full-fledged war. Yes, of course it's about uh, Ukraine, and, and that matters deeply to us. Uh, but this is about something even bigger, I'm afraid. It's about the whole uh, European security architecture. Over the last few months, the Europeans have emphasized a united front against Russia, amongst themselves and with their American counterparts. But French President Emmanuel Macron, who's spoken to Putin twice in four days, endorses EU talks with Russia instead of U.S.-Russia talks. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, who talked to Putin today, has downplayed the Russian threat. Germany sent Ukraine helmets but refuses to send weapons and publicly declines to threaten to kill the German-Russian pipeline Nord Stream 2 in case of invasion. Meanwhile, the NATO countries along Russia's border, including the Baltics and Poland, lend their full support. Today, Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki criticized Germany for giving Putin leverage over Europe. Nord Stream 2. By launching Nord Stream 2, Berlin is giving Putin the weapon which he will use to blackmail the whole of Europe. Okay, so let me make a couple of points here. First, this clip again touches on the role that French President Macron is planning, playing and trying to negotiate a way out of the crisis. France takes somewhat a different approach than some of the other countries in the NATO alliance. Macron has spent years cultivating, cultivating a relationship with Putin, meeting with him many times. He's made statements regarding the crisis that are much more accommodating of Russia's security concerns than countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. For example, Macron has been quoted as saying during his talks with Putin that there is, quote, there is no security for Europeans if there's no security for Russia. Moreover, Macron's repeated calls for a larger voice for the European Union in any negotiation or a new security arrangement in Europe may signal a willingness to entertain more options than hardline NATO members like the United States or the United Kingdom. And the clip goes on to highlight how British Prime Minister Boris Johnson took a very different approach by first going to Ukraine and publicly declaring his commitment to side with Ukraine against Russia. Poland and the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have, made, have taken similar stands that side more strongly with Ukraine and against Russia. These different approaches, one more accommodating and the other a harder line, were evident in some news that came out just today. After the relatively friendly visit between the French president and Putin a couple of days ago, British leaders and officials made their own statements. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson spoke at NATO headquarters and warned that Europe was in a very dangerous moment and spoke of the possibility of an imminent Russian invasion. The British foreign minister also met with the Russian foreign minister in Moscow to discuss the crisis. That meeting was not as friendly as Macron's meeting with Putin. The British foreign minister again warned that Russia would face high costs if it invaded, and Russia responded that it was the West and not Russia that was escalating the crisis with what it calls fear-mongering talk of a Russian invasion that he claims is not being planned. After the joint news conference, news outlets once again highlighted how far apart the two sides are on the fundamental issues underlying the crisis. Okay, so there's that bad news, but there is sort of a glimmer of hope out there, I would say, right? There, one of the things that has already been uh, touched upon by uh, some of the clips here is that um, a major development over the past two week has, weeks has been this emergence of a possible way out of the crisis through what is called the Minsk Agreement. And so we're going to take a little closer look at what this agreement is and how it could possibly provide a way to de-escalate uh, the crisis and avoid a war in Europe. And so we're first going to watch a clip that provides an overview of the Minsk, Minsk agreement and then we're going to go ahead, uh, let's go ahead and run that clip now. The Normandy format was born in 2014. Ukraine and Russia in the same room with Germany and France. They negotiated the Minsk agreements, which called for a ceasefire in Donetsk and Luhansk, the breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine backed by Russia, and find a political solution. 
The Minsk agreements require both sides to remove heavy weapons, Russia return control of the international border that separatists control, and Ukraine's parliament to allow Donetsk and Luhansk, quote, self-government and reform the constitution to allow, quote, decentralization. Today, Macron called Minsk the best way forward. The Minsk Accords are also the best protection of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Based on the commitment of the two sides, Russian and Ukrainian, we now have the possibility of advancing negotiations. And yesterday, Putin said Ukraine had no option but to accept Minsk's demands using crude language. Like it or not, you have to suck it up. But Russia has never removed its weapons or given up its control of the border. And Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, today said handing over autonomy was dead on arrival. I have repeatedly said we are open for dialogue, but we won't cross our red lines and no one will make us cross them. Macron says he's not trying to make Ukraine do anything, but he's long cultivated a relationship with Putin. In five years, the two have met dozens of times, including in Versailles, the historic home of French kings. And in 2019, he hosted the only meeting between Zelensky and Putin, alongside then-German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Last month, Macron, who is running for re-election, said the EU should hold its own talks with Russia rather than rely on U.S.-Russia talks to defuse the crisis. For both us and Russia, for the security of our continent, which is indivisible, we need that dialogue. We have to, as Europeans, lay out our own demands and put ourselves in a position where we can make sure they're respected. Whether Russia intends to de-escalate and respect demands for diplomacy will be tested again Thursday, when the Normandy format meets in Berlin. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the Normandy format. So it's called the Normandy format because of the countries involved and they're uh, part of the, you know, World War II uh, core group of countries that fought there. And their first meeting was in Normandy um, during one of those commemorations of World War II. Just, you know, a little background for you. Man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so what is this Minsk agreement? So the first thing to note is that it was an agreement designed to end the 2014 conflict in eastern Ukraine. So the separatists, uh, Russian speakers that wanted to sort of break away from uh, Kiev and, and Ukraine, uh, supported by Russia, they were fighting this war. They came to a ceasefire and then tried to orchestrate and, and construct a, a bigger uh, negotiated settlement of that conflict, and that's what this uh, Minsk agreement was. The other thing to note about the Minsk agreement is that it has a lot of great provisions, it seems, that kind of provides a, a compromise solution. None of them have been fulfilled. And so this is, a, this is a, a, an agreement that they came to and quickly broke um, on pretty much all the provisions. And so, so they're trying to resurrect this as the way out, but uh, one needs to bring a little bit of caution and, and skepticism to that because it didn't really um, have any uh, staying power the first time. But we got to hang on to something. So this is what the main provisions of the Minsk agreement are. First, Russia would guarantee an independent Ukraine in control of its own borders. And so part of their compromise is that Ukraine gets to be a sovereign state. And Russia would remove all irregular forces from eastern Ukraine. And this is a part of the problem of implementing this negotiation is because Russia refuses to acknowledge that there are any irregular forces in eastern Ukraine. There might be some Russians fighting there, and they might have been soldiers in Russia, but they're on vacation. Is, is the, is, that's the official statement, you know? I mean, everybody has to decide how to spend their vacations. That's what they did. And so, so Russia doesn't acknowledge that there's any irregular forces, but Ukraine says there are, and Western intelligence also says there are. So, so that would be part of the provision, and that part has not been satisfied. Uh, Ukraine also has some military in the region and in, in is fighting, with, uh, using that to fight with the separatist forces. And both the um, Ukrainian regular military and the separatist forces would be required under this agreement to disarm, right, to, to remove their armaments um, from the battlefield in that region. And so that's um, another part of the agreement that hasn't been fulfilled. They've, they're still fighting. Um, and most importantly, 
um, as sort of the big compromise and concession to Russia on uh, in this particular agreement is that there would be a change in the Ukrainian constitution that would provide more autonomy for those Russian-speaking regions in eastern Ukraine, known as the Donbass, uh, to uh, have a greater autonomy and then self-government within a uh, Ukrainian state. And so those four provisions are the core of the Minsk Agreement. And what uh, France and French President Macron, plus Putin and Zelensky have said is that this is the place to start to try to come to some sort of agreement that would de-escalate the conflict and avoid war. And so the hope here is that the renewed Minsk agreement, if it could actually um, start the two sides talking and start some agreement on what is clearly a uh, compromise from both sides, um, or sort of packaged as that, uh, could uh, provide a way to avoid uh, an invasion by Russia over Ukraine because it provides each side with um, something resembling a, an acceptable state of affairs, um, or at least something that's preferable than Russian invasion and occupation of Ukraine. And so the biggest hurdle, perhaps, to this whole thing becoming that off-ramp is Ukraine, because Ukraine has publicly so far stated that there's a red line here on um, autonomy for those Eastern Ukrainian um, uh, regions, and the sequencing is really important, and so what Ukraine is insisting is that Russia gets out of Ukraine first, and the separatists disarm first, and then they can talk about um, autonomy for those eastern regions, whereas Russia wants the autonomy first, and then maybe we could talk about disarmament. So, All right, so now we're going to shift gears a bit and look at the domestic debate on the Ukrainian crisis within the United States. We're going to concentrate on a story about comments made by the conservative commentator Tucker Carlson on Fox News that have gained some traction. And again, we're doing this to examine the broader split within the Republican Party over the grand strategy of the United States and the foreign policy positions of the United States. There's an emerging split within the Republican Party, and so we want to look at that. So let's watch a short clip about this controversy first. Uh, I got to play you a clip here from Tucker Carlson, which has been leading more and more Republicans, rank and file Republicans, to question what we're doing with Russia and Ukraine. Here's what he said. At this point, NATO exists primarily to torment Vladimir Putin, who, whatever his many faults, has no intention of invading Western Europe. Vladimir Putin does not want Belgium. He just wants to keep his Western borders secure. I'm sure you love being asked about a cable TV news host, but it has led quite a bit of <laughs> rank and file Americans to, to ask this question. I mean, are you worried that there is a movement in the Republican Party that has become pro-Putin? Well, I wouldn't call it a movement, but I think we've got to be sure we're understanding what's going on here. The Ukrainians are not asking for American troops uh, to come to Ukraine. And I've gotten a number of phone calls from some of these uh, uh, cable news shows saying, you know, we've got to keep our troops out of there. They're not asking for our troops, nor is anybody uh, talking about that. We are talking about strengthening the countries around the region who are looking for more help, NATO countries uh, like the Baltics, like Poland. Uh, second, Again, this is about the fight for freedom. I mean, this is a country that has decided that they want to be like us. They want to be a democracy. Uh, they want to respect the rule of law. Mm -hmm. They want to have a free enterprise system that's strong and vibrant. Uh, this has all happened in the last eight years. And, and they have turned to the EU and turned to mm -hmm. the United States and said, we want to be part of the West. And by the way, every year, Chuck, it's becoming more and more evident that that's where the people of Ukraine are, which is, I think, one reason why Vladimir Putin is moving now, because right. he sees it falling away toward the West. America always stands for freedom. You know, we, we are the country that believes that okay. people's free will ought to be respected, that sovereignty matters, that, inter right. uh, that the, 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 the dignity of the Ukrainian people matters, and this is what they want. So their territorial integrity is at risk right now, and it's appropriate that the yeah. free world stand by them. All right, so first, let me say that the Fox commentator, Tucker Carlson, is an extremely influential figure in general, particularly important in Republican circles. He is the top-rated news commentator on television, 
having just surpassed his fellow Fox commentator, Sean Hannity, in 20, 22, 20. 2020. 20. His program, which airs every weeknight, reached an average audience of 4.3 million viewers, making it the largest audience for any program in the history of cable news. He also has the most viewers in the 25 to 54 demographic, so he reaches a broad audience. So that, that statistic from 2020 was the height because, it, it, because of the pandemic and everything, it, the viewership went way up. It's, it's gone down a bit since then, but he's still the number one. Okay. By, he's got twice the viewership of say like, or three times Anderson Cooper or anything on the other side. So second, Carlson is closely tied to former President Donald Trump and has pursued many of the same issues and themes that Trump did. We note this to emphasize that Carlson is a daily voice for millions of Americans, especially those with a conservative perspective. In short, now that Trump is no longer president and has a much smaller social media presence, Tucker Carlson is arguably a major voice for that part of the American electorate. He reaches more American Americans and influences their opinions on political issues than any politician in the country. What he says, what he says, what he says has an impact. Consequently, what Tucker Carlson said about the Ukraine crisis and how the United States should respond was newsworthy for a number of reasons. First, his comments were controversial because they were outside of what both Democratic and Republican elected officials had been saying. Again, and that's important. Outside, he's viewed as conservative, but he was outside of what Republican elected officials have been saying. Carlson questioned the wisdom of an American approach that sided with Ukraine over Russia, asking, quote, why is it disloyal to side with Russia, but loyal to side with Ukraine? He also said that Ukraine was strategically irrelevant to the United States, and that Vladimir Putin was justified in mobilizing over 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border, saying he just wants to keep his western borders secure. That's why he doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO, and that makes sense. Just to be clear, Ukraine is not part of Russia. Russia agreed when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 that Ukraine would be independent. So Ukraine is not part of Russia, and Russia agreed to that. That's the core of this. Right? And Carlson is talking as if Ukraine is part of Russia. That's not the case. So, you know, there's an analogy here that's being used, too, about border security. And so this is emerging to this kind of talking point that Biden cares more about the Ukrainian border than American southern border. And, yeah. and that's an interesting but sort of bizarre, if you will, um, analogy because the two issues are completely yeah. different, right? I mean, it's not, this isn't an immigration issue. It's a, it's a threat by Russia to invade and take over and end the independence of Ukraine. And, and so. And it's, yeah. a, and it's a device to try and use terms in the American political debate to reorient the, the views of Americans on U.S. policy towards NATO and Ukraine. Right, he's trying to change minds, and that's significant. And this is, and it's also significant to point out that this is a break from where the Republican Party has been since 1945. Right. So, so for generations, the Republican Party was the the security party, the 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 anti-communist party, the and even after the end of the Cold War and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the sort of. Um, more hostile, more uh, skeptical uh, party of uh, Russia as a potential, uh, you know, partner rather than enemy of the United States. Yeah. And so, so this is a real change yeah. uh, here. And one final quote on NATO helps to highlight Carlson's different perspective on the Ukraine crisis. He said, quote, at this point, NATO exists primarily to torment Vladimir Putin, who, whatever his many faults, has no intention of invading Western Europe. Note, he's saying that NATO is offensive, is revisionist, is trying to remake the order, the, the international order, and it's Putin who is acting defensively. Again, Putin wants to change the status quo in Ukraine. He seized Crimea in 2014. That was a violation of Ukraine's territory that Russia had agreed to in 1991. I mean, the, the language here is one that's an interesting one because so few Republican politicians have used it. There's more now because, I would argue, 
there's a cause and effect here, and the cause here is Tucker Carlson going on the air voicing these opinions, and now some Republican um, candidates running for office are echoing that. But the the depiction here is that that Russia and Vladimir Putin are the victims of um, Western sort of expansion in and aggression, and the that side that correlates very well with what Putin yeah. is saying. And yeah. you know, um, there there have historically been critiques of U.S. foreign policy throughout the Cold War, um, even during a containment when there was broad bipartisan consensus. And so it's not sort of out of the realm to for for reporters or, or the media to question these things. Um, but this is a real difference from the, 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 the standard position on both parties on this particular crisis right now. And, and, and the other thing that's significant and why we're talking about this, and this came through in the clip on Meet the Press with Senator Portman, is that both Republican and Democrats Elected officials in Congress are now saying publicly that they're getting calls and complaints from constituents about the U.S. policy on Ukraine because of what Carlson has said, is that exactly. voters are calling their office and say, I saw on Tucker Carlson, why should we care about this border? You don't care about our border. So, that, right. so the point is he's engaging and he, he's shifting some public opinion in the United States about foundational U.S. interests relative to Russia. All right, and, and the reason we're talking about this is just to demonstrate that there's a growing divide between leaders of the Republican Party, right? So this is an intra-Republican Party split. The elected Republican representatives in the House and the Senate and rank-and-file Republican voters. Yeah. You know, and the, and the interesting thing here is about the, there. there's two kind of strains here. One is the anti-interventionist strain, right? That that you can, you, there, there's a, there's a, Drain within the Republican Party, and it's, it sort of predates the Trump administration that had this sort of, you know, was frustrated with the long wars in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq, and, and so it has these deep roots and frustrations of American intervention around the world. And, and that's part of it, and, and Carlson, some of Carlson's comments, you know, um, uh, build on that. They said, we've got enough problems, our economy can't, you know, tolerate this kind of action, we, we should mind our own business kind of thing. And so that anti-interventionism is, is a long-standing part of the Republican Party, and there is an anti-interventionism in the Democratic Party, too, and that was exemplified um, most clearly by Bernie Sanders in his presidential campaigns through the 2000s, uh, in, in the 2010s and, and, and the like. Um, but there is something new in a way about the way Tucker Carlson kind of packages this, right? Um, so. And that it's, and, and this is reorient, it's, it's oriented towards the reorientation around Trump, which introduced and helped to cultivate a new and less hostile approach to Russia within the Republican Party. Trump campaigned on a message that he could establish a working relationship with Putin and Russia. And so Carlson's relatively positive take on Putin's intentions seemed to reflect that broader Perspective now, and of course, this debate could complicate the Biden administration's attempts to deter Putin with threats about painful retaliatory economic sanctions if Putin invades Russia. For the most part, many leading Republican politicians, such as Rob Portman, shown in the clip, or Texas Senator John Cornyn, have been on board with Biden's tough approach against Putin. They've pushed back against Carlson's comments. But I think the quote was, "We're the decision making here. Yeah. Decision makers here, not you." Right, and so. Um, the upcoming midterm election complicates things for Republicans and their position on the Ukraine crisis. An examination by Axios showed that Republicans running for election in 2022 were more likely to question the U.S. tough stance on Russia or to avoid comment on the situation. The implication here is that these representatives are trying to be responsive to what they perceive to be an increasingly anti-interventionist voting base. And Tucker Carlson's comments are having a direct effect on this dynamic. Republican congressional offices, as we noted, around the country, and some Democrats as well, are feeling lots of calls from voters echoing arguments that they heard on Carlson's show. I mean, again, that's why you, we look up the viewership. There's no politician that has that kind of access 
every night. This is the weekly, yeah. week, every week night at 8 p.m. Millions of people tune into this. There's no politician that has that kind of yeah. that kind of reach, right? And so, and so that's what's sort of driving an interesting um, domestic debate here. And and so. The controversy here of over Tucker Carlson's comments and the split within uh, the Republican Party between its elected officials and the rank and file just reminds us that the that U.S. foreign policy is um, not just an international process, but it's also a domestic one. And so, uh, we're going to end today's session by taking a quick look at some opinion poll data. Uh, on American public opinion with regards to the threat posed by Russia and the current crisis in Ukraine. And, you know, I, when I looked up, I, there's not a whole lot of public opinion survey um, work out there on this because it's a pretty recent um, crisis. But um, I was expecting a lot bigger partisan difference between the two parties, right? And, and what the Pew poll that I found... Um, shows is that there is no significant partisan differences between Democrats and Republicans on the Ukrainian crisis. Both Democrats and Republican respondents in this poll tend to see Russian aggression in Ukraine as more of a minor than a major threat. And um, then they also think that um, the public support then for a, a strong action definitely uh, is not there for any sort of military one, which is uh, not really on the table anyway. But this sort of perception um, about whether Russia is a competitor or a threat and an adversary is also interesting. It's kind of evenly split. There's not this broader consensus that you kind of see in statements by elected officials that, yes, of course, Russia's an enemy. It's been an enemy for a long time. It's a threat to Western alliances, threat to Western institutions. It invades other countries. It has to be stopped. That kind of language doesn't get reflected in some of these opinion poll responses that don't see Russia as quite that um, major of a threat. And so what this could signal, and, and we'll have to wait and see, is that the public, the American public, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, might not have a deep-seated support for really strong actions against Russia in reaction to an invasion if it entails a serious cost domestically, right? If, there's, if, if we impose a huge uh, sanctions on Russia because it invaded Ukraine and then gas prices go skyrocketing, I think that there'll be a real serious uh, debate domestically about whether that was... Uh, a successful thing that should be continued. And so um, there is one last thing from this um, poll that shows that there, those who've heard more about the information on Russia's bill of tend to think that Russia is a more major threat. Now, that might be a self-fulfilling prophecy that people who think Russia is a bigger threat follow it more closely, like yours truly. But, um, but there's an, and it's, and it's an interesting um, debate. And so that's it. And so that's where we're standing. Uh, we will kind of keep a watch on this and, and talk about um, next week, perhaps uh, as a final sort of close, some of the broader uh, ramifications of all of this for international relations and U.S. foreign policy. So, Sounds good. Have a good weekend. Yeah. And we'll see you next week.